Hi all, this is the Make Haven badging video for MIG welding. This is the welding area uh, at Make Haven. As you can see, there are protective screens around. These screens block out some of the dangerous UV radiation that comes off when you're welding. The UV is the same coming from the sun. It can burn your skin, and it can also give you a, like a sunburn on your eyes. Uh, so it's really important to protect yourself, but these shields are protect passers-by. So it's important to let people know in the area that you're gonna be welding so that they aren't looking at it inadvertently, but then these screens are also for protecting their eyes. We're gonna go from top to bottom on, on MIG welding. Uh, however, this is gonna cover safety, uh, how to protect yourself as well as the equipment. This is not gonna make you a master welder. We'll have classes in the future that can go over some of the finer details. So welding, is when you're putting two pieces of metal together. And doing so in general, though not always, by melting the two pieces of metal. There are a lot of different kinds of welding, certainly hundreds, but for our purposes, it's, it's when the two pieces of metal melt. There's like stir welding, doesn't matter. People can argue about that, it's not for now. Um, MIG welding stands for metal inert gas. The metal is pretty obvious. The inert gas means that when the metal is molten, when you've actually melted it, it reacts with the oxygen in the air, which you don't want. And so what you do is there's an inert gas that blows around the metal when it's molten that protects it from the oxygen in the air so that it is a good strong piece of metal once it cools down and re-solidifies. There are a lot of different names for all the different kinds of welding. So another a uh, name for MIG that you might hear is GMAW, GMAW, or gas metal arc welding. The gas we covered, the metal we covered. Arc is when you, is a, any kind of welding where it uses electricity to make a really powerful spark effectively between an electrode and your work. So whether that's with stick or TIG or MIG, even plasma, there is an arc being created and that arc produces a lot of heat in your material and also a lot of light. So that is where a lot of the danger comes from. Something else is that in a MIG machine, so we can come over here and actually look at the machine, you can also run something called flux core. So flux core is sometimes thought of as totally different than MIG for a few reasons. Um, one is that it doesn't require a tank of gas. So if you're out in a field somewhere dragging this thing around, big pain in the butt versus just carrying this thing. The idea is that this tank of gas provides a shield around the molten metal, which is great. But sometimes you don't want to carry that tank around. So instead you have flux core. Flux, same as when you're soldering, is a chemical that helps to protect from the oxygen when you are welding, when it's molten. So uh, it can also help with, with other properties. So that is where the flux is built in, so it doesn't actually need the additional inert gas. It creates a get cloud of gas around the weld on its own. So you can imagine that being pretty helpful. We do have a spool of that here, and we'll touch briefly on how you would use that. Technically, it's not MIG because there's no inert gas, but it, it does use the same machine. So this particular gas is a mixture of argon, which is a noble gas that is very unreactive, non-reactive, and carbon dioxide. So 75% and 25%. And that is what is shielding the weld. That's sort of the optimal shielding gas uh, for steels. When you start doing other metals, you want other gases. So here in Make Haven, we have sort of the, the basic normal setup that most people are gonna want. The option is available to you if you wanna go out and buy your own gases and your own wire. Speak to a facilitator to make sure everything is safe and and you know, everything is being done in a safe manner. All tanks need to be well secured to the wall. So we need to make sure to have a, um, either, you know, you're securing it safely in your own space or it's secured safely on the wall. Um, so we'll, we'll touch on that briefly as well. 
in general, like in this basic setup, when you come into Make Haven and when you're doing the badging, the this setup is for welding mild steels. This is an example of that. This is square tube stock that is popular when you're doing legs on a table. For example, here. Inside this machine, it's doing a few things. One, it's taking the AC electricity from the wall, alternating current, where the electricity is going up, down, up, down, up, down, and converting it to DC, direct current. So that's just one straight line. And that's nice because when you're welding, you don't want the electricity to be bouncing back and forth. That would make your arc jump all over the place. You just want one continuous spark or arc. Um, there are a few exceptions, but not in MIG. MIG is only DC. But then it gets a little more complicated because you can have DC electrode positive or DC electro negative. In general, you want electrode positive. Uh, sometimes it used, used to be called reverse uh, welding a reverse polarity, DCEP is now what it's most often called. And the idea there is that it's actually, the electrons are coming from the material, from your work, and they're then concentrating around that point in the material, heating up, heating up, and then coming into your electrode. Uh, in straight polarity, the electricity is coming from your electrode and then going into a broad area in your work, wherever it can contact. So that creates a less concentrated uh, heat, like the, the, the electricity is going through that metal and creating heat from resistance. Um, so in that orientation, it's not penetrating quite as deeply. So in general, we like DC electrode positive or reverse polarity. You can, however, swap those in there. And again, we'll, we'll touch on that briefly. So in terms of just the anatomy of what's going on here, so we know what we're working with, because that's important. This is fairly dangerous. This is the gas, we covered what uh, this particular gas is. Um, the, the gas is stored at a very high pressure, so it needs to be treated with respect. Uh, it should never be dropped. You can imagine if it were to get dropped and this part gets knocked off, this is just a missile that will launch through walls. See, these are brass fittings. Brass is relatively soft, so it can squeeze into other fittings and, and make a good snug fit without any Teflon in general. That does also mean you can't crank on these fittings. You'll, you'll strip them out pretty easily. So you just want to get them nice and snug. Uh, this, there are two gauges on here. This one is indicating the pressure in the tank once this is open, once the, the tank has actually been opened. Um, this, if you turn it counter, like left, counterclockwise, it'll loosen it and let the ga gas out. And this will show you the pressure left. Once you start getting really low, you should stop using it um, you know, once that needle is, so the red is PSI, which is what we're going to deal with. Once you're at, you know, 100, you should probably turn it off and post on Slack, tell a facilitator so we can go and replace the tank, get it refilled. Um, so this is indicating pressure in the tank. Pressure is how much force it's pushing here with. This is not reading pressure, this is reading flow. So there's a little steel ball in there, which you can probably see. And as the gas starts flowing, it lifts that ball up. And so this is a flow meter. So this is saying at any given moment how much gas is flowing. Right now the whole thing's off, so no gas is flowing. I marked with a Sharpie right here how, where you want that ball to sit when you're welding. So you want that ball to sit around 25, this is measuring in cubic feet per hour. So you want about 25 cubic feet per hour. That's why, where you want that ball to sit. And this knob here controls how much that gas is going to be able to flow. Um, so right now, I'll bet it's set at a pretty good place. When you're done with any kind of welding that involves a gas, you want to purge the line. So this is open so that gas was allowed to come out. This is obviously closed. It's very important when you're done that all the tanks are closed so that the gas doesn't just escape and blow away. And that could be very expensive and potentially dangerous to people. So then it comes through the hose and it goes into the machine. So for all, all these gas fittings, we want to make sure there are no leaks. That's pretty important. Um, this isn't a terribly dangerous gas, but it's still expensive and we want to make sure it isn't leaking. So I'm going to show you over here. This is where a spray bottle of soapy water is kept. So what we're going to do is I'm going to open this valve. Uh, and for most gases, you want to open them up all the way. You want to open them slowly at first. You don't want to just crank it open. We're going to open it slowly. So that needle is coming up nice and easy, not whacking open. More, more, all right. Now I'm gonna open it all the way. 
And that's just because sometimes if you leave a valve in the middle position, it can leak a little bit. So we're gonna open you all the way up so it's nice and snug. And I'm just gonna spray the soapy water. You don't need to do this anytime except if you suspect that there's a leak and you wanna find it, or if you're changing fittings out. Say we got a new tank, we put it in, then you need to make sure there are no leaks. Um, and here we can see there are no leaks. The way you would tell is it would be foaming. F if it makes foam if there's a little leak and it makes big, big bubbles if you are, this is just dish soap, if, uh, if there's a bigger leak. So here we can see it's all, all nice and snug. Um, and right now there's, there's a whole lot of pressure. So there's almost 2,000 pounds per square inch in this tank. So these fittings are doing a good job of holding it. So that's great. I'm gonna put this back. We're gonna look at how the internals of this welder work. And this is the uh, Miller, uh, Miller-Matic 211. Uh, it lives over here next to two tanks of gas and I'm just gonna roll it out so we can get a better look inside of it. Uh, and you're welcome to do this if you need to get to the inside. So this is how the side opens up. There's just a little latch that lifts up here and we can get in a little closer. All right, so there are a few things going on in here. We have the spool of wire. Uh, this can be whatever material you want. We have a few on stock, in stock here available. If you're using a lot, obviously try to get your own. Uh, we, in general, if, if you can, get it to be 30 thou. So that is the thickness of the wire, 0 0.030. Um, and that just lines up with all the other components in here, so that's convenient. If you're doing really fine work, you might want thinner. If you're doing really heavy, you might want thicker, but that's kind of what we're using here. Uh, you can get bigger rolls too, so uh, that would just go on this collar. So you would take this nut off and then put this collar on, and then you could put on bigger spools, and this nut just holds that on. Then this spring is tensioning this nut and spring are, are tensioning this spool so it doesn't just spin wildly. This is like a big spring, and if you just let go of the wire, if this can spin freely, it'll spin freely. So you wanna make sure that this nut is on there snugly so it doesn't go spinning around on you. Then looking in here, so we have the torch handle coming in from the right side, and it's held in right here. So it's important that this is seated fully back, like to the left here, so that it gets a good gas seal. Um, and we should be able to pull backwards actually, so you can see what's going on. So there's some O-rings here, and those sit back in there, and that's where the gas comes in. So it's important that that's snug. And then there's this other wire that comes in, and it attaches right here. So there are actually three things going on here. The wire is being fed, and it's being clamped on here in these rollers, and it's being fed by a little motor and this is applying tension. So right now it's set around the, you know, two and a half mark. Um, if, you're, if you're wire, it's not coming out, then you obviously want to increase tension a little bit. Uh, you can play around with that, but it should be at a pretty good place right now, and the manual lives right underneath if you need to refer to that to change the tension. If you're changing the wire, then you just lift this. This springs up, you can pull this out, Make sure to put the wire through the little hole in the spool so it doesn't go crazy on you and get all twisted up. That would be a big waste. Um, and then when you're putting it in, you just feed it through and then clamp down. This little roller needs to line up with the right gauge. So you would just turn this if there wasn't wire in it to line up with the size wire that you wanted. Uh, and then air is being injected here. So you need to make sure there's a good seal so that the air and the electricity and the wire can, can all go in properly. So there are a few processes here. The flux core, so then it doesn't use gas. Uh, MIG for stainless steel. Then MIG on steel using 25% CO2, 75% argon, if that's what we're using. MIG for steel with 100% CO2. And then MIG on aluminum uh, using the spool gun. So you choose your process. Then here you would activate auto set by selecting the wire um, diameter right down here. Uh, well, I'll show you that on the front of the machine. And then select the thickness of the metal being welded and it will take care of the rest. So you can do that. Alternatively, you can set it manually. Then we're gonna look over here at polarity. So we mentioned this briefly. Um, if you wanted to do flux core, 
uh, then you would switch the polarity. So that would be coming down here and undoing these nuts and swapping them. And then please, if you were to do that, put them back when you're done, because no one's gonna think to check that and they're just gonna be really confused about why their welds are coming out so terribly. So that's important. Then over on this side, so it tells you based on the material what sort of things you should be doing. So we'll look at steel first. Um, it says what polarity, what wire type, what gas you're using, the diameter, and then based on that, so let's say in this case we're welding steel, we're doing electrode positive, we're do using uh, ER70S, which is this, and then the difference is the gas mixture, so we're using the mix, and we're using 0 .030 wire size, and I'm pretty sure it's eighth inch steel that we're looking at, so coming all the way over here. So then, it, so it says we should have it set to 6.5 for the voltage and 70% of full speed for the wire speed. So setting this is a, is, a, is a bit of a balancing act and that's why they have the auto set feature. The idea is that if you have a bigger piece of metal, then you need more current. If you're using more current, you're gonna be melting your feed wire faster. So you need to increase the speed. So in general, when you have more current, then you, have more or more voltage, you need more uh, wire speed. There are some counter examples to that, but in general, that's the idea. The two things you're trying to balance, and if you aren't balancing them, say you know the current is too high, then it's just gonna it's just gonna be burning up the metal immediately before it can actually deposit anything, and vice versa. If you're putting out more metal than it can melt, it's just gonna be bouncing all around and not looking great. Another note is that we are actually running this off 240 volts. So we can refer to, to this side, the dark blue section of this chart. Uh, so we actually, if we're doing eighth inch um, and we went down to our mix for 0.03, then it looks like we're at 670. So just slightly less of the voltage setting. Uh, and I'm, I'm sort of using voltage and current interchangeably here. And, and the reason is the the voltage sort of dictates what the current is gonna be. So this machine has a maximum current that it can put out before overheating uh, at each voltage. So we'll go over that a little more when we look at the front. So on the front of the machine, there are a few things going on. We have the torch coming out, uh, and then we have just three controls. So the top one selects the process. So in this case, we are looking at MIG, steel, and it's CO2 25%, argon 75. So that's the right setting there. Then if we wanted to do auto set, what we would do is turn this knob over to our wire thickness, which in this case is 0 0.030. And then over here, we would just tell it how thick the metal is. And this is the, the blue ring. So the blue is the auto set. So we would turn it in this case uh, to an eighth of an inch and we're ignoring the voltage because it's figuring that out for us and the wire speed and we're good to go. So this little light would turn on if it's doing auto set. This is a temperature indicator. So these machines have what's called a duty cycle, which means that they can only uh, work for so long before overheating. So in this case, I forget exactly what the duty cycle is, but I, I don't expect most people to hit that unless you're welding for you know, five minutes straight. And realistically, most people weld a little bit, then check it, move things, brush things, weld a little bit. So that's not in general a, a big concern. And this is just power. So this is what's called a work clamp. So the work clamp clamps on your work. Some people call it the ground clamp. Other people don't like it when they call it that because sometimes the electricity is actually flowing the other way if you're doing flux core. So we just call it the work clamp to make people happy. Then on the back side, there are a few other things going on. So we have the power switch, pretty important, and the power cable. And then this is the gas line coming in. So right now the gas is hooked up to our mix tanks. You can see here argon 75%, CO2 25%, and the tank is off, which is why the pressure is reading zero. This actually is using a quick connect fitting because if you were using, uh, if you were using aluminum, then uh, in the spool gun, which is hanging on the wall, you can watch another video to learn how to use the spool gun, then you'd want to attach this over here. So that's why this is this kind of fitting. So you can disconnect those easily. Another point is that this is a Millermatic 211, and that means that it can put out a maximum of 211 amps. So that's, 
that's just sort of an indication of the capacity of the welder. If you were trying to weld an inch thick of steel, then you would need to do it in multiple passes. So you would grind a bevel so that it was the two pieces of metal looked something like this. And then you would first do a root pass going down and then you go back and forth or you could weave this way to fill up that gap. But you couldn't just take the two pieces and zap them together like you could for an eighth of an inch thick piece of metal. So we're gonna look at the anatomy of the torch as it comes out. So this is the torch. Um, it has a few things going on. So handle, obviously, this is the trigger. Uh, and then up here, this is a, uh, this helps to, to, it's a gas lens. It helps to focus the gas right where you're welding. So that's pretty useful. This is the wire coming out the tip. And then this is the contact that is bringing the electricity right into the wire. So it's important to make sure this is clean. If you're changing the wire to a different kind, you want to put stainless steel in or something else in, then you need to make sure to remove this while you're feeding it. One of the cool features of this gun is if you just hold down the trigger when it's on, um, after a few seconds, if it, isn't, if it can detect that it isn't actually welding anything, it will auto feed the wire quickly so you can get the process through more quickly. Then once it comes through, you, you know, check to make sure this is still clean. You can use a little um, brush up on the shelf I'll show you to clean this out if need be. And then slide that right back on there. And then if, uh, so, so when you're welding with MIG, it can be pretty splattery. So the inside here could be a little gunked up. So if that were the case, then what you could do is use these nifty MIG pliers. So these have a bunch of purposes. They, so one of the jobs is they can snip. So you take the side with the snippy bit and put that farther away from the lens, put it right up against there, and then you can snip it off. Uh, and then you could use the tips just to clean out the inside to get, to get the gunk out of there. So that's pretty nifty. Um, there are a few other features that you know, can hold on if things are stuck and whatnot. Then the electricity is coming out of here. When you squeeze the trigger, it will feed the wire and the gas is shooting around it. Now we're gonna make sure that the gas is set up properly. So over here we have two gases. This is pure argon, which is used for aluminum when you're using the spool gun, which is another video or when you're TIG welding or other certain things. Uh, again, the sheet in here describes pretty well when you should use what. The, uh, and then this one is an argon CO2 mix, which is predominantly what you use for MIG welding. And on here, there, there are two indicators. One is this pressure gauge, and this is ending the, indicating the pressure in the tank. So right now, no pressure, because this is off. Then this is indicating flow. So flow, is how much gas is moving through it. So right it, now it's, 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 well, so it measures in standard cubic feet per hour. Um, and what we can do is we can turn on the tank nice and gently. So I'm gonna open it all the way. Okay, and you can see that there is pressure, but there's no flow, uh, which makes sense. We don't want there to be flow because we're not squeezing the trigger on the gun. So I'm gonna squeeze the trigger and gas is gonna come out and we're gonna make sure that it's close to that Sharpie line around 25, 25 CFH. And the machine is off. So I'm gonna turn the machine on right here. And it comes to life. And I'll squeeze the trigger, we'll look here. And that's pretty good. We could maybe bring it down just a hair, but right around 25 is fine. So now the gas is flowing, um, so that's pretty good. If you wanted to change gases, this is a disconnect, quick disconnect fitting. So you just push up on here, slide the collar and remove it, and then you could swap it over to here. Um, if you do that, Make sure to turn this off first. So I wanna apologize if there's any confusion because of the two machines we're using in this video. The yellow one is our older MIG welder and then the blue one behind me that we were using is the newer uh, Miller, uh, Millermatic 211. So that's a higher capacity, higher quality, better MIG welder. 
Luckily, most MIG welders are pretty much the same in terms of how you use them. You set the voltage, you set the wire speed. Uh, this one happens to have the auto set feature too, which is a nice bonus, but in terms of how you actually use it, they're fairly similar. So I hope that didn't, doesn't cause too much confusion. And we're just gonna look over here on the shelf to point out all the bits and pieces we have for MIG. So these are some extra tips and lens for the welder. Uh, right in here and then this is just a gauge measuring tool so you put it on your piece of metal and it tells you how thick it is what gauge it is gauge is just a, me a measurement for thickness um, these are some different spools of wire so this is aluminum so you could use this in the spool feeder so that's another video and then this is stainless steel so this is pretty expensive but this is good if you're welding stainless steel uh, and then this is also where any other accessories like the the mig pliers live and then obviously there's a fire blanket, should there be a fire. The reason uh, for the welding table, it's made out of metal, is because if you're welding something, you can have it sitting on here, especially if it's clamped, and then you just clamp onto the table because this whole thing is clean and conductive. So this, in general, you wanna clamp onto your work if it's possible, but if it's not, you wanna just make sure there's a good connection between the two, so you would clamp this down. The reason is, obviously, you should never have bare skin, we'll get to that soon, but let's say your shirt was wet, you were sweating, it was hot, and you lean your arm on the table, you could get a shock because that electricity now can go through you more easily than the work if this isn't good clean and a good connection. So that's why in general you do want to clamp right to your work. In terms of the electricity, you do want to make sure that it has a good electrical connection. The way you can do that is by making sure it's clean. So you grab a brush and wipe off, uh, you know, whatever, when you, when you buy this kind of square tubing, um, it's pretty dirty, you know, these gloves are this color from carrying the steel. So, you know, bear that in mind, it's not clean to start with. So you can do is grab a brush. The brushes are labeled for what they're for. So this says steel, these say aluminum. Those are just the two most common kinds of metal. We do have other brushes you can use. The reason is you don't want to get little flakes of aluminum. So this brush, just to be clear, isn't made out of aluminum. It's made out of stainless steel, um, but it's for brushing aluminum. So you don't want those flakes of aluminum to get onto your steel, and you don't want flakes of steel to get onto your aluminum. So you keep them separate. So this is steel. So you just clean this off, and it gets nice and shiny. They, when they manufacture the steel, they cover it in um, oil so that it doesn't rust. This has obviously gotten its oil cleaned off of it. So that's good. We're just going to be getting these surfaces. And then the next step, is using a degreaser like simple green and this just cuts through the oil so you just spray some of that on as i get the table wet i just said it was not good and that just takes the oil off so now you have a nice clean surface to weld and in case this wasn't clear the, the welding when, when you're welding it's making a short circuit and that short circuit if you've ever seen one makes it can start fires it's in general a bad thing we have circuit breakers to stop it but this is an instance where we want it we're using that so short circuit to make a lot of heat um, cool. So now we're going to talk about safety. This is obviously of paramount importance, so we're going to spend a minute on it. One that we covered already is the ultraviolet rays. That can burn your skin, it can burn your eyes, burn other people's eyes. Uh, it's, it's something you need to take very seriously. There's no, there's no like flipping up your helmet and trying it for a minute. Um, it, it'll cause what's called welder's flash, um, which is where you get a sunburn on your eyes. It's excruciating. It's been, I've heard it described as having sand and salt just rubbed in your eyes. Um, you don't want that. And, and you can see old welders whose eyes are all kinds of messed up from having welded irresponsibly with regard to the UV. There's also infrared, which is how we experience heat through light. Um, so you need to protect your skin from, from the literal heat. Something like WIT, MIG, the welding process, creates a lot of heat. Uh, you need to wear pretty hefty gloves to protect yourself from that. Another thing is that the light, the ultraviolet, is dangerous even just in your peripheral vision. So let's, you know, if you're walking by, if you, you know, you, you just need to be very mindful of not catching that arc in your eye. Uh, in general, to be considerate to other people, we'll want to close up the shields around us and weld on this side so that your back is to other people and your body is protecting them from the, the rays. So there are a bunch of different types of gloves. Um, they're living right here. These are, are, are TIG gloves, generally. So they're really thin. With TIG, you want to be as dexterous as possible and have fine control because you're feeding wire and 
Um, so that's what, what these are for. You know, you can use them for other purposes. These are the other end of the spectrum. These are super heavy duty, mostly for, for stick welding. Um, so these give you very little dexterity, but could also be valuable. And then I'll grab another pair for MIG, which is kind of in the middle. Something that is very important is that anything you're wearing, be they gloves, shirt, pants, hat, you name it, it can't be made of synthetic materials. So it can't be polyester, nylon, whatever. If the sparks hit those, it'll just melt, which is maybe worse than bare skin because then it's this nasty plasticky material melted onto your skin. Um, so you can't just grab normal work gloves. They do need to be leather, Kevlar, something that is not gonna melt. In terms of clothing, it needs to be wool or cotton, cannot, cannot be synthetic. So just need to, you know, you can't just throw a hoodie on uh, unless you're very sure that it is a 100% cotton hoodie. So this, you know, isn't always intuitive to people. Molten metal is very hot. You, you are pumping it a huge amount of heat into something. So if, when we weld these together, these pieces of metal are gonna be super hot. So hot you can't, you do not wanna pick them up with your gloves because what will happen is those gloves will get super hot. You won't feel it for a minute. And then even after you put those down, the heat will radiate through the gloves and start burning your hands while you're not even touching them anymore. Um, so you really want to just let, you know, hot things just sit. You don't want to, you don't, you can hold it with pliers. So that's why we have those, the pliers. You can grab them, put them, do whatever you want. So you can use the pliers to dunk it in water. You don't want to be leaning on things. Uh, you know, when you're using a torch, you're not, waving it around, there's like the heat is very consequential. In terms of the safety gear, we can come over here because it's put on the outside. We can just start from one end and go to the other. So these are jackets, these are welders jackets. They go all the way up to your neck. Um, they are obviously flame resistant, um, different sizes, small through large. Uh, we have caps. so. Just a baseball cap is probably gonna have synthetic material in it, as well as it won't cover your ears. Getting a piece of slag in your ear, worlds of not fun. You get to listen to your skin burning, as well as experiencing it. You really want your ears covered. Um, and if the mask isn't doing that, which it might, then you really want a cap. So what a mask won't do is covering the top and back of your head and the back of your neck. And when you're welding, sometimes that splatter is coming back up and over and you may not feel it for a minute, well, if you have thick hair, but it'll get down and then you'll feel it and it will be a lot of not fun. So these caps go on and they're like reverse baseball caps. So they, they don't go forwards, that wouldn't be helpful, they go backwards. And this bill is to protect the back of your neck. So like this, they protect your ears and go back to protect back here. Um, ear protection isn't super necessary for MIG welding. Uh, and in general, you want ear plugs because trying to wear ear protection and a mask is pretty difficult. So now we'll get to masks. There are a few different styles. The best style comes with two features. One is it dims automatically, um, meaning you, you don't need to lift it up and down to change, to, to be able to see and not see, because that would require you getting set up and then lowering the mask and then welding blind for a second. Um, what these do, is they have a sensor that detects when you've started welding and in a flash of a second, they turn the dimming on so that you don't get blinded. Um, and this, the second really cool feature is that you can change the amount of shade that they have. So here, it's the maximum. It's, it's set to 13 when we're at weld. Um, and you could bring it all the way down to five. So five, as we'll see in a minute, would be good for brazing with an oxyacetylene torch versus you know, stick welding with a, with a lot of current, would you would want all the way up to 13. The two other knobs here are sensitivity. So let's say you were welding out in the sun. The sun's really bright and it might be triggering this all the time. And you'd be like, no, I need to be able to see. So then you would turn the sensitivity down. In here, look, compared to the sun, the lights aren't very bright. So you just leave the sensitivity at 100 or high. Uh, and then there's delay. So what delay does is after you're done welding, it will, keep the dimness on because even that molten metal, once you're done welding, is still very bright. So it'll give you a few seconds to let that cool down before bringing, before letting you see again effectively. And then there's this little slider. Uh, weld is at one end, cut is in the middle. And what that does is it uses the lower number setting on here. And then grind just turns this into a normal face mask. So you can wear this 
and be grinding and making lots of sparks and protecting your face without the dimming capability. So that's good. Now we're gonna look at this chart because this is gonna tell us what shade we should use. So we're not stick, we are mild steel MIG with argon. This is mild steel MIG with CO2. So we're somewhere in the middle. These are line up pretty well with each other. And then amps, uh, we'll just consider the worst situation, which is 135, which is the full capacity of our machines right about here. So it's saying 11, 12 is our setting. In general, you just wanna protect your eyes as much as possible. But if you're set to 13 and you can't see anything, that's also no good. So you should consider 11 or 12 the minimum, but 13 might be more comfortable. And so that is where you should would go as long as you can still weld well. You wanna make sure that all of your skin is covered, your face, neck, uh, make sure you're wearing closed toed shoes. Again, you really don't want them to be synthetic. If you're wearing sneakers with a mesh on top, the slag could just melt right through that. Uh, so you probably should be wearing something that will not melt. And you really need to be wearing closed toed shoes, 100%. You need to make sure that all the flammable, if you have like a roll of paper towels for cleaning the steel, make sure anything flammable is well out of the way. You don't want sparks flying and catching something on fire. Things like pockets and even like in here in the laces of your shoes can get, can catch some slag that'll sit there and get hot. And the slag is just the, the melted metal. So now in terms of gases, we have a fume extractor over here. So the fume extractor is just a very localized source of fume extraction. So this whole room already has a really good airflow and conveniently it's located right above us. Um, you do wanna make sure that when you're welding, this, this should be on whenever there are people in here, but um, just double check to make sure there's air flowing. And then this extracts the smoke directly from the source. Something that people do when they're not really thinking about it is they'll put their face right over the well directly into the flow of the smoke. You don't wanna do that. Even with really good collection, you don't wanna put yourself where you're breathing it in. So make sure to orient yourself in such a way so that you know this can turn. You can really get it. It's you can get it into most any position that you need. It'll reach clear across the room or this little area. The switch for this guy is right up on the wall, so you want to make sure to flip that on before you get started. Um, and then this is just to control the, the amount of airflow. So this is closed. This is open. In general, better just to leave it open. So in terms of metals, if you're welding stainless, you need to wear a respirator in addition. And as always, use the fume extractor. Galvanization on steel, when it's heated to the temperatures that the welding causes, the zinc comes off. And if you breathe that in, you're in for a really bad time. So you need, what you need to do is grind off any and all galvanization anywhere close to where you're welding. So uh, you may think you're welding right in this joint, but in reality, this whole area is getting very hot. In fact, it's called the heat affected zone. So you need to grind off any galvanization remotely in that area to make sure that you're safe. Um, and then, as always, fume extractor. Any other coating, paint, uh, chrome, like any other coating, you just want to grind off and have well away from where you're welding. That is the long and short of all the safety. And now we're actually going to get to the welding, which is pretty cool. So I'm going to put on the safety gear. I'm going to start with a jacket. And uh, in addition to the mask, you keep your safety glasses on, you know, because you're going to flip the mask up when you're trying to look at things and things can still be spattering. You, you know, don't want to be leaving your eyes unprotected. The pants are made out of cotton and the shoes are leather. So I think we're good in that department. Then I'm going to put a cap on. These just have a little bit of elastic, so they adapt to different head sizes. And gonna tuck the bill down into the collar of the shirt, grabbing a mask. So we set 11 or 12. I'm just gonna set it to 13, because there's no reason not to. Delay I'm gonna put in the middle and sensitivity all the way up, making sure it's set to weld. On um, these, there are a bunch of different things you can, sorry, things you can change. I'm just gonna try having it at the normal settings. This is just to tighten the head strap. So I'm gonna put it over my head and then tighten it in the back. So it's nice and snug. And then what you can do is raise it all the way up and tighten these guys on the side so that it doesn't fall down. And then it'll, so it clicks up when this is nice and snug. So now it's up and then it can come down. 
Um, and last, I'm gonna grab some gloves from over here. We'll get more MIG specific welding for now, uh, gloves. For now, I'm gonna use TIG gloves, which are fine. I'm just gonna be very careful not to touch the work. Well, I, I just grabbed another piece just cause fitting up these two little guys was not just convenient. So I cleaned this one already. So I'm just gonna clean a spot on here. So again, just grabbing a steel or a brush labeled for steel, cleaning some schmutz off of it. So I want a schmutzy weld and getting the grease off. Some people would say you want to degrease it first and then brush it because when you're brushing, you're just grinding the grease right into the metal. We're not building buildings here. It's called fit up is how good of a job you do getting them really close together. So here they're, they're pretty good. If you wanted it to be a really good weld, you could weld, uh, you could grind a bevel on this first. So you go over to the belt grinder and grind a, an angle on that. So your weld would sit really deep. Um, the penetration on this isn't incredible. So it's not gonna blast its way all the way down there. So if you want that, you need to grind that down. Conveniently for this weld, we have access to a lot of that surface. Something to note is that in general, you want a tack weld first. So a tack weld is just a little, just a little drop of weld holding it together. Um, and then that lets you, you can still kind of bend it a little bit and work it so that you can get it just exactly right and then go all the way around. It can be tempting to fill just every possible line of, of connection with weld. That doesn't necessarily make it that much stronger and it just takes a while, uses a lot of gas, uses a lot of metal and time. So uh, in general, you know, every, say if you're doing, like I was putting this table together, like every foot you want uh, maybe an inch or two of weld. It doesn't, it doesn't need to be continuous all the way around. Um, you can see here the heat affected zone from welding underneath from that, that weld. The current was probably a little higher than it needed to be there. Uh, okay, so clean this guy. It doesn't look like I got that edge. I'm gonna clean this. And then we're gonna go through the steps. So we're gonna have this here. Um, I'm gonna use a magnet to hold them together. Just gonna clean some of the iron filings off of that guy. And these magnets just clink it right into place. They are really skookum. All right. All right, so, I mean, these, these magnets are really kicking, so it's kind of tricky to get it all lined up, but that looks pretty good. Um, all right. And now I'm just gonna clamp our work clamp right to the piece. So we have really good electrical connection. Um, that should be good. And if you wanted extra clamping power, you could take this guy, stick it here just so it extra doesn't move. This is a pretty serious clamp. We also have a lot of vice grips up on the wall by the entrance to the metal shop. So you could use those if you wanted uh, to clamp things down, <clears throat> excuse me. All right, so now we're not going nowhere. Um, we have a really good fit up and we're clean and we're brushed. Looking pretty good. You can get the flammable things further away. Okie dokie. So we're gonna come over here and set up our settings. There we go. So we're sitting right at about 25 now. We've got this big long stick of wire. Um, so I'm gonna put gloves on. I'm, I'm not pulling the trigger Right now, obviously, but uh, still don't want to shock yourself, even though the electricity is coming from the plant. So we're going to grab these guys. So one of the many functionalities of these is they have snips in them. And if you have the snips on the far side, so right now they're on my, my right, they're on the far side from the camera, and you put it right up against here, it sets the proper stick out, which is about a centimeter. So now... It's coming out the right length. Uh, you want to do that pretty much every time you start a weld. So what happens is as you start welding, it leaves a little ball right at the tip. Um, and that may, is a bad way to start your weld because the electricity is kind of shooting out in every which direction. So every time you start, you just want to clip off the end. And when you're done welding, to be considerate to the next person, you should just snip off the ends. They have a nice, nice start. Um, all right, that's set. Our gas is set. So now we're gonna look at the voltage and the speed. So we're doing eighth inch steel. So steel, 
check. CO2 argon, check. 0.03, check. And we're doing eighth inch, which is 0.125, eighth inch, boom. So it says we want a voltage of four and a speed of five to six. Cool. Um, the speed and the voltage come up together. As you have more electricity, it's gonna melt that wire faster, so you need it to come out faster. So this is set to four, this is set to five, um, five and a half, see what happens. So the speed is continuously variable, the voltage clicks into certain positions. When we're welding, there are a few things that we're gonna look for. One is there are different styles, so this is considered push welding, where you're going forwards and relative to your direction of travel, the torch is tilted backwards, that'd be push. And then this would be pulling, where relative to your direction of travel, it's tilted towards it. Um, people have opinions, obviously, so many opinions. I think pushing is in general easier and better. I'm sure there are exceptions, but it keeps your weld puddle, or weld pool covered in gas. It's easier to see what you're doing. So we'll just, we'll just start there. In future classes, other teachers may have other opinions. The classic sound you're going for is the sound of crackling bacon, which is what they say. I don't cook a lot of bacon, so I don't really know what that sounds like. I think I have a vague idea. Um, but you get a sense for what doesn't sound good. For examples of what doesn't look good, we can look at this guy. So just to get a sense, let's see one that does look good. This is, this is okay. Uh, it, there's not great deposition. There should be more metal coming out. Um, there aren't actually many good ones on here. We should put one good one as an example. Most of these have, uh, they were either too far away, there wasn't enough gas, they didn't clean it well, there was too much wire and not enough voltage, and all those things result in really proud welds. These are beads just like sitting on the top, not doing anything. There's a little bit that's attached to the base metal or the parent metal underneath, but most of that filler is just sitting on top doing nothing. These at least have fused pretty well, so they're sitting down in there. But even that looks like there wasn't quite enough metal coming out. Um, some people will try to weld with one hand. Don't, don't do that. Two hands, you want to really have a nice fine control. Uh, in terms of the distance, you, you want to maintain a, about a centimeter distance, like about the stick out that this clipper sets, you want to maintain. So you want to stay that distance away. You want to push and go nice and even. You can weave going back and forth. You can go straight. In general, for something like this, we're trying to bridge a small gap. So what we want to do is go back and forth. We're going to start on one side and we're going to let the electricity heat up that piece of metal. And then we're going to go over and let that heat up and then back and forth. So we're just going to pause a little bit on each side just to let it really melt and get in there. In the middle, we're not melting anything except this teensy little piece of wire. So you don't need to hang out in the middle. It's on the sides where you want to hang out just a little bit so that the juice can flow through the, the metal and get it nice and red hot. There are all different kinds of, of shapes. People do C's and loop-de-loops, -loops and you can practice that all you want. So some of the things that we're going to be looking for are you don't want a lot of sputtering. So here, I mean, sputtering will be like, you'll just see it spraying crap everywhere, excuse me. Um, here you can even see, oops, <laughs> there's, uh, this is a piece of the wire that just got stuck on and they blew through it here. They, they put a bevel, so they were, there's a bevel you can see on this piece of material, which made it thinner there, but they didn't change their speed or voltage, so it just blasted through the piece of metal. Um, you can see here there's a piece of the wire sticking out. And then all these little, they're called BBs, like, like, oh, one just dropped right off. The BBs are the little just droplets of metal that spray and get stuck to things. So you don't want that. But you need to make sure your ground clamp is getting good conductivity. Uh, you need to make sure the gas is getting good coverage. Um, making sure you, your voltage is high enough that it's melting and not just blowing it around. If you're hearing like, if you're just hearing the, the wire being fed, then your voltage might be too high for the wire speed. So it's just, it's just melting it as soon as it's coming out. And so it's not even getting a chance to, to feed. So you just need to increase the speed a little bit. If your speed, if your, if your wire speed is too high, it'll be like as it's just trying to like shove metal in, but it's not melting fast enough. You don't want porosity, you don't want it to look like bubbly, because then you're, you check to make sure your gas is flowing, you haven't run out, make sure that everything's open. I am going to move this piece of paper. I'm gonna turn our fume extractor on.
All right. So one test you can do is to look up at the light and your screen should dim when you look up at the light and that'll confirm to you that your shield is working. So what we're gonna do is get set up. And it sounds pretty good. All right, so we can look at that now. And it looks to me uh, a few things. One, you can see this yellowish stuff. So over here, this is no good. This, this is porosity, holes, whatnot. So you should probably grind that back and, and redo it. There's also this, this yellowish stuff. You would use a brush and scrape that off, especially if you wanted to do another layer on, on top. And it looks like the current could, was a little bit high. This just looks pretty flat. So I was going back and forth, but you can't really see any ridges. It's pretty smooth. I could either turn the wire speed up a little bit or the voltage down a little bit. That's the idea. You saw the tilting, you saw back and forth, and obviously I only raised the hood once it was done and once it cooled off a little bit. Um, the delay was already set in there. So now we're gonna look at the shutdown procedure for this. So you wanna make sure that everything is wrapped up nicely. So our work clamp is wrapped up here, and then we're gonna wrap this uh, on here, and we'll be considerate to the next person and snip off the extra, sorry, MIG wire that is coming out of the end. So I'm just gonna grab the pliers and snip this guy. And pick up our trash. And then we're gonna turn off the gas. So first we're gonna close this tank. All right. And now the tank is closed. And we're just, we can actually leave the flow setting where it is for the next person, because that should be about right. Um, and uh, you can purge the line if you want. Um, but if you don't purge the line, it's actually a good indicator of a leak because if you came back later and saw the pressure was down, you'd know there's a leak somewhere in the system. So I'm just going to shut it down by pushing the power switch right on the back here. Uh, if you ever were to go over the duty cycle, uh, meaning you drew too much current from the machine and it, it overheated, then there's a little breaker on the back, this little guy. So you just push that to reset it. So it's a little 30 amp breaker and it just plugs into the wall here. So you could unplug this if you wanted to put in a different tool. Um, that's where this goes. This is the 240 volt breaker. And that's how you make weld. Thanks for watching.